Hello, everybody. This is Sean Jakes. I am uh, a director of product marketing at Testum, and I'm joined today with um, by two people, by our fearless leader, Oren Rubin at Testum, our CEO, and Federico Toledo, who is uh, the, the one of the co-founders of Abstracta. And um, really excited for this presentation. Hopefully, some of you actually participated in this survey. We did the survey back in June timeframe. And um, you know, we we um, we asked people to participate, and we finally got the results, and we've accumulated them into this this webinar. Now, one of the things that um, we're doing a little bit differently is rather than just show you the results, what we're going to do is we're going to bring uh, Oren and Federico into the conversation, and then talk about some of the different findings that we have as we go through them. So hopefully, we'll get a little bit better. Um, you know, some insights into what they're seeing, both inside the survey and, and inside the, the customers that they deal with. So um, without any ado, that's how, without further ado, that's how we're going to go through this. Um, let me start by uh, introducing our two panelists today. First of all, Oren, our fearless leader. Oren, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and, and, um, and, and some of the things that you're uh, most excited about at Testing? But of course, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I, I guess to make sure things very, very short, uh, I've been in, in, in tech for the last, I don't know, 23 years and uh, building products for developers. Um, in the last almost 10 years, I've been focusing on the test automation world, which I found super, super hard. <laughs> and but on the other hand, very, very exciting and very, very helpful to uh, to people. Uh, I taught at some universities about web technologies and uh, I've worked a lot on distributed and compilers, but uh, in the last 10 years, it's it's all about testing. All right, um, let's go to uh, Federico and then I'll come back one second to you, Oren. So uh, Federico, give us a little background from, from your perspective. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Federico Toledo. I'm from Uruguay. I I, I live today in uh, since one year uh, ago. I moved to Berkeley in California. I'm the COO and co-founder of Abstracta, which is a company fully dedicated to providing software testing services, including automation. So I, I've been sharing and discussing many things in the past with, with Oren, and I'm so happy to be here again, co collaborating with this amazing team. Thank you for <laughs> the invitation, by the way. Let me um, let me uh, um, let's just ask you, uh, Federico, if you would just give us like one uh, interesting fact about yourself that people don't know. About myself, well, um, I already mentioned that I'm from Uruguay. I'm from I, I grew up in the countryside. Uh, I'm passionate about nature, and I think it's mainly because of that. And um, I'm married to. Uh, to uh, biochemistry. My, my wife is uh, uh, researching here in UC Berkeley, and she's also uh, working with things related to nature. And we are always discussing about how, how our works are also connected with, with nature, even though we are working in technology. Uh, so, that's that's great. That's great. I, I can see you guys have some interesting conversations, and um, uh, probably more interesting this survey will be. But uh, anyway, we we did promise the people we talk about the survey. Warren, do you want to do the same thing? Give us a little uh, uh, a nice uh, factoid that people wouldn't know about you. Ooh, um, I think everyone knows that I play guitar. I'm going to surprise because Federico, I thought he was going to go with the hike. Uh, but uh, but something that people don't know about me, um, I play chess, a chess variation, which is bug house. It's uh, two boards, four players play that every day. There's almost, there's no day that goes by without me playing a few games. I will go there. That's awesome. Uh, here's a, a non, non so secret factoid about myself. Um, I am an outdoorsman. I do love to uh, do lots of running outside. Uh, today, it was um, seven degrees and we had six inches of snow here in Colorado on the ground. So I did not get outside this morning. Instead, I had to run on the treadmill, which was not very fun. Uh, I haven't run on the treadmill in, in about uh, seven months. So yeah, not so great. But I'm also a fly fisherman and um, can't wait for ski season, yeah. but it's a little too early for the snow to do any benefit for me. 
right now. So, uh, okay, without any further ado, let's move on. So who did we survey? Let's talk about that uh, to start with. So we, we did, um, so we reached out and most of, if you look on the left-hand side of the survey, we see that about, oh, oh by the way, we're gonna turn off our webcams uh, just to make sure that we don't have any problems with the, um, you know, voiping or anything like that. So hopefully that will um, give us a better success as we go through this webinar. So about um, three quarters of the respondents were from teams of less than 100 people and about, um, you know, 22% or so were, were above 100 people. So some large teams, kind of a, a nice little mix there. And then if you look at the kinds of people who are the roles that, that filled this out, 46% uh, were automation engineers, 18% were developers or dev managers, 16% were QA testers, 13% were QA managers, and then we had some others. So with that, we're going to ask a poll question to kind of see what you all are doing. So let me just see if I can do this. And how do I do that? <laughs> all right. Um, and yet. Winston, you see any way to do that? I'm not seeing it. All right, well, I can't seem to get that figured out, so we're not gonna spend any more time on that. Let's just get right into it. We're gonna assume that you guys have some role in testing and uh, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it at that. So, okay, so where does QA sit? Oh, here we go. Sorry, we just go. launched, poll was live. <laughs> awesome, okay, so everybody. Uh, Winston to the rescue. Spend a minute here to um, to to tell us where your uh, what your role is. I can't tell if we're getting any responses or not. Okay, well, we uh, apparently need some work on the polling because I can't figure out whether anybody's answering the question. I can't. They, they are, and sorry, I'm 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 gonna unmute so I can. Uh, I, the, we've got a couple more people that are still taking it. Let's give it another five or ten seconds, and I'll close the poll. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. Let's see the results. I can't see the results. Oh, here we go. All right. So, oh, where does QA sit in your organization? Um, a separate role within an integrated development team. Hey, look at that. 50% compared to 55.6% on our current survey that we're showing right here. A uh, separate team that supports multiple dev teams. Um, that shows up at number two. Developers who do their own QA. Um, yeah, so pretty similar to what, what the results um, showed from our survey. So definitely, you know, a lot more um, of that separate role within an integrated development team. So let me let me just ask our um, is the poll off the screen? I can't see what's on the screen. OK, so uh, let me ask our, our panelists here. So based on kind of what you guys have seen historically, um, the way teams are organized QA and what we're seeing from you know this poll and, and what you're seeing outside in in different customers, you know, where do you find, you know, QA sitting and, and moving, you know, where, where, where do they sit today and where are they moving? So I'll start with Federico. Yeah, I, I could say that uh, I agree with, with I, I see more or less the same uh, numbers that the pool and, and the, the survey uh, says, um, because in most of our projects where, where we work, we, participate, we integrate our testers to the development teams. It could be working with Scrum or with Kanban or other methodology, but they, they collaborate all in the same, uh, with the same goals uh, and also participating in the daily meetings, in the retrospectives, even in the demos with the customers and, and, and also in the plannings. <clears throat> in some cases, uh, Imagine if we are talking about a, a team of uh, 10 people, maybe one, two, or, or even three testers 
where one of them uh, focuses on automation especially this is probably the most common scenarios in some other cases we also follow a, a more like a waterfall approach but it's only in, in some few projects but yeah I, I would say that in most scenarios it's like like the pool size okay or aren't anything to add do you have any uh insights you wanted to add no, no not too much i think uh, i think we all see that it doesn't matter how you call it uh scrum teams or uh pod squad team <laughs> um it, we see more and more that that uh, uh companies move to a, a place where we have uh, uh those teams business units that uh everyone's doing one specific focus in, in in the business and everyone is aligned with what are the outcomes so they want to put someone which is uh, the developer there, the product there, the, they want to um, at the QA there. They want to have everyone lined in, in the passive within literally sitting next to each other. Now the world is going remote, but uh, uh, but they're all focused on the same thing and know and they know the product intimacy. Yeah, I mean that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean you you need to know the product in order to be able to do the the testing of the product and um you know i i've heard some people talk about how they're part of those those um you know the stand-up meetings with the development team and making sure that they understand what the sprints are so that they know what to focus their testing on over the next couple of weeks so um that all makes sense okay so let's move on and um, if you uh, if you allow me to to uh, add something else uh for me it's surprising to see less than 20 percent of the developers doing some testing activities Maybe it's because it's phrased as QA and maybe they are thinking only in the functional testing or the manual testing. I, I'm doing quotes. <laughs> you cannot see me, but I'm doing quotes with the manual thing. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, maybe uh, I, I was expecting like, uh, you know, with the shift left approach uh, or within agile teams, I was expecting like more involvement of the developers in the testing activities. but. Yeah, maybe it's the, because of, they are thinking only in QA. Okay, yeah, no, that that's good, and, and, you, and you're right. There's a number of different things that could be influencing that, um, including where, uh, uh, you know, where, you know, the people that just happen to be on on the survey. So, um, okay, so let's see what tools or frameworks are they using for end-to-end -end testing now. Selenium was was uh, by far the most. So Forty percent of people responded that they're using Selenium. Um, a fifth of the people said Testum, uh, Cypress, and then there was 6.7% said none, and then there was a bunch of other choices that, that kind of all added up, but everything was pretty pretty small individually. I won't, I won't talk too much more about this. It, you know, it does seem to kind of mirror the things that we see in the industry, that there's lots of Selenium users out there. Okay, so let's, let's go into uh, test automation today. So we asked a number of questions about, you know, where they are today, what are their challenges and, and stuff. And so that's what we'll chat about right now. So what, what skills are most critical for testers? And this one I thought was kind of interesting that, you know, test design and architecture showed up as number one. Now they could answer more than one, one um, uh, answer. They could select more than one answer, I should say. Uh, coding skills to create automation was number two. Test strategy was number three. Um, bug reporting, test analysis, um, you know, showed up a little bit lower, and then there was a few other things that that we didn't present on the slide just because they were lower in the thing. Um, the thing that I find interesting about test design and architecture is it sounds kind of like coding, and I was wondering if you guys wanted to talk about that. Even even when you're using, uh, you know, automation frameworks that maybe aren't coded based, there still seems to be a um, a need for those skills to be able to understand how to um, establish a test and architect it in a way that that makes sense. Uh, Oren, do you want to lead off and, and talk anything about um, what you see in these these data points? Yeah, sure. I I agree. I totally agree. I think um, I'm surprised it's not a hundred percent. I think this <laughs> is the 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 test design that's the most important. Uh, skill. Um, I'm. I think there's there's a the test design is a must. And and the second thing, as you said, it's about the implementation. There's the, as opposed to strategy versus the tactic, and um, and the test design and how do you architect it? That involves a little bit of both, because that involves first of all understanding how 
what to test and how to split it into reusable components, which is which I think is um, one of the key for success is is how to reuse. Uh, and that's what what in, in general I think software engineering. That's one of the best things. Uh, we all know the different names. Uh, uh, dry, don't repeat yourself. There's the die, which is uh, do it only. Uh, what is I? Uh, so there's the one that do it only once. There's there's so many uh, so many things that lead to the same thing, which is how do you design something well? Whether uh, and of course in computer science we see that um, the focus on well designed and evolution because your application keeps changing and your test will change. So you have to make sure that your tests are are written well, uh, and of course, reusing that that uh, speeds up not just the authoring of the test, which is a lot of people what they're thinking about. They always think about how can I uh, write things faster. You need to think of the day after, which is how do I maintain it, um, and and I think that is where. Is there is there anything uh, new that you wanted to like tease out a little bit about something that Testum's about to release here? Uh, <laughs> help them in that um, Well, officially it's going to come out tomorrow, but I can give it a small teaser. Um, I, I I think we we made a Testum, and uh, I didn't we didn't talk about too much about what Testum, but uh, uh, about uh, I I'm a great believer in in code reuse, and and we're going to show tomorrow. Of how something that can help and, and suggest to you how to reuse code. So when they say, "Hey, you have duplication, how can you turn that in, in, in with one click of a button to reuse your components?" But uh, but I think that those aspect aspects of and it doesn't matter by the way if any whether you use testing or any programming language or any infrastructure reuse of code of reuse of functionality. That's the most important thing, and I think we see it here and I. I think it should be even higher. All right, so that was some good feedback on uh, test design architecture and reuse. Um, uh, Federico, anything you want to comment about any of the other categories? Yeah, actually, something to, to add a different perspective here, because I, I really agree with all the, what Oren uh, mentioned, but uh, uh, if you ask me this question, without the options, I would mention communication, empathy, uh, critical thinking, okay, for testers. And maybe for test automators, I will answer critical thinking, communication, uh, empathy. Because, you know, I, I wouldn't trust the, the quality assessment of uh, a product, uh, the quality of what we are de uh, developing to someone who, who behaves like a, uh, a scripting machine, you know what I mean? It's like I, I, I need someone with, with a very engaged with the business, and, and there's where other and also very engaged with with the team and and with the collaboration. And whereas uh, other skills are also very important. Uh, of course, if you are thinking in automating, it you, you have to pay a lot of attention to the hard skills, uh, coding, uh, and also test design and architecture, but I, I, I also wanted to, to, to mention that it, it's really important to pay attention to this other type of, of, of skills as well. Yeah, those, those are good. Those, uh, those soft skills, yeah, it's probably because you're living near Berkeley is where you get that those touchy-feely things, right? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to say that you're so, you're so right with the soft skills. I think also those are the ones that are critical, by the way, to to the soft skills to move move along. And if you if you're looking at being a, a, as a manager or a lead, I think those are very very helpful uh, to get you there also. Yeah, I I agree. And you mentioned empathy, and uh, I read a book um, recently about uh, you know empathy and leaders, and it's one of the most important things that 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 helps uh, drive success and. In, in organizations as leaders with empathy. Um, so let me just move on. So what what percentage of your end-to-end -end tests are automated? And so you can see that um, you know less than seven less than eleven percent or around eleven percent had less had greater geez okay start over again. Eleven point one percent had greater than seventy five percent of their end-to-end -end tests automated. 
um, and 14.3% had between 51 and 75% automated. If you move down, you start to see that you know quite a few didn't you know don't have a lot automated. So 74.6% have automated less than their uh, less than half of their end-to-end -end tests, including 12.7% who haven't automated any that, that they're all manual. Um, I'm, I'm going to go on to the next question before I, I ask for feedback here. Uh, the next question was, what percentage of your end-to-end -end tests are cross-browser? So 47.6% um, said they don't run cross-browser tests. And 22.2% said less than 25% of their tests are, are running uh, on cross-browser. So given these two data points, um, any, any thoughts that you guys have? So the first one, again, uh, what percentage of your end-to-end -end tests are automated? And then the second one, what percentage of your end-to-end -end tests are cross-browser? So uh, Federico, you want to start? Yeah, my, my comment here is that I was expecting more people um, taking advantage of the uh, automation for cross-browser testing because uh, in, my, in my case, uh, in my experience, most of the cases, this is one of the main goals. So it's, it's uh, weird for me to see that uh, half of the people are not paying any attention to that or having a, a, a getting anything out of the auto automation for this goal. Yeah, I, I just saw a new survey by um, Lambda Test yesterday that that said that you know the the main browser is Chrome. You know, sixty some percentage of, of people you know, use Chrome as a primary browser, but but um, Safari is still 17%, and you know you still have other other browsers in there, mm -hmm. Firefox, and um, you know a couple of others that um, you know maybe aren't too popular in the United States that um, are also being used. And so then you start to wonder, you know, is your application actually working the same across all those different different browsers? Um, or in any comments on this or the uh, the other one? Uh, I, sorry. Oh, Federico, go ahead. No, the other thing uh, that for me is important is like uh, how okay we we can focus only in Chrome, but what about uh, Chrome in different operating systems in in a mo in a tablet or in a mobile phone or something like this? So uh, cross browser is still uh, I mean cross platform let's say let's call it it's also inter interesting even this uh, number that you just revealed, Sean. Yeah, that, that that's a great point. That's a great point. Oren, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I think, so when we look at testing and we're, it's always about what do we check compared to um, what do we get? What what more, what bigger, wider safety net do we have? Um, as I think as as, the, as uh, browsers get more closer and the, the difference between them uh, uh, gets smaller, we see less and less people running different on different of operating system or different browsers because then then the likelihood there's the the edge they're saying hey I can test all that I can run um, but what do I get out of that and and if the the, the JavaScript engine is is close to 100% similar with all the engines and um, I think that there's a there's a lot of cases where people say wait a second do do I need this right now and it depends also when do you run it do you run it uh, on, on pull request, or are you running it on on uh, just before releasing to production? So I think people are question. testing different things. Or oh, that okay. <laughs> so let's, so yeah. let's, just, let's just jump there. When do you run your end-to-end -end test? And 60.3% um, said before each release. 38% said on a scheduled basis. 30% uh, after a code commit. So you're pushing to a repo. Um, you know, 28% are still just running it on an ad hoc basis, and then 19% are running it with a pull request, so after merge. So just just thinking about the development lifecycle and you know different places when you can do end-to-end -end testing, how do these results match up with what you think are best practices? So I'll, I'll start with Orn since you were kind of on that point anyway. Yeah. So first of all, just to complete the, the previous um, uh, discussion is that, by the way, there are some like developers that in their mind, their state of mind is, I'm testing on Chrome. I work with Chrome, I test. It usually is, I work on, it works on my computer, we all know that. Uh, so that usually is, is, the, uh, is the state of mind. And, and you'll see that they say, hey, Chrome is enough. And that's what they're running it. 
as opposed to, uh, I think, QA engineers or, or the QA in general that would say, hey, I want to do cross browser. I want to I make sure that everything else uh, yeah, is work, or at least I know the risk. Here, it's when to run it and what are the chances that I'm putting, I'm adding a bug. So, for example, before a pull request, that means um, you have different points in time where the likelihood of a bug would happen and you, you want to spend some time and resources on making sure that there's no bug. So I can, on every commit, people run unit tests. That makes sense. It's very fast, it's very short. Under a minute, you get the feedback. And on a pull request, you want to run more tests and usually more end-to-end -end tests even, or at least API tests. And then before production, you want to go and, and say, hey, I want to trust, I want to run all my tests, not a sanity, not a, not a, a subset, I want to run all my tests, and I want to run cross browser, I want to run it on uh, to cross operating system, I want to make sure that everything works. I do this once, uh, sometimes I do it once a day, or once a week, or once a month, but I don't do it, there's much more pull requests, um, and you want to get the feedback faster. So pull requests would be shorter, less testing, uh, you don't cover everything, but you want to get in five, 10 minutes, you want to get all the feedback that you can, as opposed to just before release, it might take an hour to release that and test everything, but it will, but, it, but it's okay, we're testing more. Okay, that's that's great. Let me, um, I'm, um, uh, Federico, Oren took all your time for the answer on this question, so I'm gonna move to the next question. <laughs> um, okay, so what's the biggest reason end-to-end tests end -to -end test fail? Um, number one answer was an element change. 36.5% said that was their number one reason. They could only select one thing, and it was twice the invalid test data. And you go down the list, you see a test design problem was 14.3%. You can kind of tie that back to one of the skills that we talked about earlier, which was you know, being able to architect a test. Um, the last one on the list was network or server latency. The one I didn't talk about is bugging the application, 12.8%. So around 13% was the biggest reason that end-to-end -end test fail was because of a bug, which means that, it, that roughly you know, 87% um, the, the test is failing because of some other reason than a bug. So I just wanted to throw this over to Federico, see if you had any thoughts on this, if this is the kind of uh, errors that you see um, when, when you're working with clients. Yeah, I think it it's crazy, sounds crazy, but uh, in many cases we are dealing with flaky tests and and, and, pay, uh, and trying to solve, to fix the, the false positives and uh, that, that we get in our results. So I think the, this, uh, this graph should, it's showing a reality that we are all trying to, you know, that we need to address in, in our test automation always. Okay, great. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, so this is kind of related. So I'll say, what are your biggest challenges in test automation? So this is a current question. So what are your current challenges? So maintaining flaky end-to-end -end tests takes too long. That's 44%. Um, the next one by a, a pretty good margin is uh, 30, almost 35%, takes too long to write UI functional tests. 33% uh, say not enough people are resources. Um, you know, 30.2% say building test coverage. And then the last one, improving communications between dev and QA. I think this goes back to one of the, uh, the, the skills that, that Federico mentioned was communication. Um, so. Yes. <laughs> so do you want to uh, continue? Is this, um, Federico, is this something that uh, kind of resonates with you? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, the maintaining the flaky uh, test uh, is a huge problem that we, we should be addressing. I know you guys are, are working hard to, to make testing a, a great tool for that. <coughs> Sorry. But yeah, uh, I think this is a, a common problem among all the projects uh, in, in with test automation. Or anything you wanted to add on this question? Yeah. Um, I, I think that the developers, the, the, the front end developers helping in, uh, it helps a bit with, with uh, 
in some of the changes when the UI changed because they changed the UI so they can fix it faster. So in, in, in getting the feedback, that's why they want to run it earlier. That's why we see the shift left and, and we want, they want to run it on the pull request or per commit because they can fix it on the way very fast. Um, that solves some of the challenges. Um, but yeah, I agree. Um, this is maintenance. That's the, the biggest thing in, in test automation. I, you know, I keep asking, I know I'll, I'll take just one more second. Is everyone always asking, oh, let's find a tool that has that is the fastest. And and I tried to explain to them, testing didn't go to the, the point of recording to be faster, to be more stable, that you can see the DOM. It's always about stability and, and low maintenance. That's the important thing. That's the key to any automation. Yeah, let's let's remember these two top answers here as we go in because a couple of other questions will address these. So maintaining flaky end-to-end -end tests takes too long, and the second one was takes too long to write functional uh, UI functional tests. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead though. Um, so what are the biggest trends impacting automated testing now? So CI/CD shows up pretty high at 55.6% um, first. AI assisted testing was second at 46. Continuous testing, shifting left, agile testing, you can see testing in production down there at 25%. Um, Federico, you wanna take this question? Is there anything that you're, uh, is this what you're seeing in the map, map kind of what you see out there in the industry today? Yeah, and it's very related to a previous answer from Oren's, which, uh, you know, with the shift left uh, testing approach, we have more engagement from different team members to participate also in the automation. It could be with unit testing or with API testing, but um, this is also, so th these trends, these um, methodologies that are getting more adoption are affecting or, or impacting the way we automate. And of course, this is also related with CI CD because we are able to, um, get more benefit from the, our automations because we are running, as you asked before, um, we are running uh, the automation from different stages uh, after each, uh, before each release, for example, or, or in different. So, so I think this is also impacting uh, the, the, the way we automate, for sure. My question is maybe how people interpreted the, the difference between continuous testing, shift left, <laughs> agile testing, testing in production, because for me, it's part, everything is part of the same thing. If we are continuously testing, we should be doing that in an agile way, uh, shifting left and shifting right, which is testing also in production, and maybe running our automation in all the stages. So, uh, yeah, but um, it's it's a fair point. Yep. Um, so so I'm just gonna uh, um, move into the next section. We'll see this question again, but in talk in terms of talking about where people expect some of these trends, and I think it's more interesting to see kind of the the difference in where people are today versus where they think things are moving. So okay. let me just move ahead to the um, to the next section where we're going to talk about test automation directions, and so. Um, so before we talked about, you know, are people using cross-browser testing? And we saw that a lot of people aren't. A lot of people are mainly just using one browser. And then so then we asked them, do you want to change? Um, how do you want to change the way that you do cross-browser testing? And, you know, almost 56%, 55.6% said they wanted to increase. They wanted to grow the, the number of cross-browser tests they're running. But still, 43% were happy with where they are today, and, and even 1.6% said that they were um, okay to decrease the number of cross-browser tests. I'm gonna, um, so I'll, I'll just uh, ask ask you guys. Um, we'll start with Warren, and you know, do you how do you find this uh, result that they want? I guess I'll just I'll just uh, leave it there. How do you find this result? <laughs> Um, I, I think that the people that don't want to have the no change, it could be that their focus right now is expanding their, their test coverage. They're saying, wait a second, I can work on making it work close browser right, right now. I want to make it first work on higher coverage in, in one browser. Um, and, and 
And I said, again, I said, develop those, if you take the 20% that, that, that were developed those, uh, for the developers, I'm, uh, I'm guessing, I don't know whether it's front end or back end, but usually that care only about pro, so let's take them out of the equation. Um, I think a lot of people do want to have more test coverage first and are struggling with that because of the maintenance. And those, those, you, you combine all those slides, by the way, you get people want to CI CD because they're, they want to be CI CD, but they're stuck with the maintenance. And then call puzzle testing, that's, that's maybe their second thought. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. Um, you know, we we uh, we don't really know what their priorities are in when we ask this question, but the next slide gives us some insight there. So let's look at the next slide. It says, as it relates to end-to-end -end testing, what are your major goals for 2020? And so it does sound like you know trying to automate manual testing is the the biggest goal that or the the most responded goal that people had. Increasing test coverage. So yes, these things will take up resources that can't be used to increase uh, cross-browser testing. So they're, they're obviously making this kind of a trade-off. Um, you look at a couple of the other ones integrating with test automation with CICD. This was um, the number one trend in 2020, according to the previous question. Shifting testing earlier, shift left, making tests more stable. This is addressing, those, those last two ones are addressing the two biggest problems that they saw you know, with, with their their two biggest challenges. So it's kind of interesting that the two biggest challenges show up lower on the on the on the chart here than um, than some of their others. But these are their major goals and priorities. What, what what do you guys think about this, and how does this reconcile with some of the other data that we've seen? Uh, Fred Federico, start with you. I think we are procrastinating about our main challenge uh, because if we, I think uh, you say that around 90% of the of our uh, failures in in the test automations are related with something different than a bug <laughs> so yeah. we should be focusing on on making our tests more stable but instead we want to automate more tests and and faster and and run run them uh, like more frequently it's okay to, to have those goals, but maybe I should pay. Uh, we, we should be paying more attention to 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 the to make them more stable and more reliable overall. Orange, do you have any thoughts on the on what their goals are here versus what we've seen in some of the other answers? Yeah, and I, and I think the the one thing that I, I, I would say that where the, there's a difference and where there's a, like, why is that making tests more stable? Why is that going to and increasing test coverage? The only thing that I've seen is also is that it depends who you ask. For example, if you're running 100 tests and if one test keeps failing, uh, some one of them, uh, some would look at that and say, hey, my build is failing. This is a flaky, I have to look at the build. That's a waste of time. And there's another person would say, wait a second, and, and we saw that 30%, I remember, if I remember the number correctly, they're running in a loop. What they're looking at, um, it's not for pull requests, it's, it's just in a loop lately. They're saying, hey, if I have 100 tests, one is failing, you save me 99% of the job, of, of the work. So I think people are looking at it differently and different uh, uh, different people you know, with, look at, the, the, as, at this as automating uh, this in a, in a different way, but most of them is, yeah, as Felipe said, you have to, first of all, start the coverage, uh, increase the coverage, but you, the most important thing is that you don't, if you're increasing the coverage with, with, with unstable tests, it doesn't help. At least on the, for the developer on the shift left, it will, it will hurt you. And we see the correlation, I think, between the making tests stable and the shifting late. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there's there's a lot of challenges that they're trying to to deal with, and um, some of these things, you know, they they all consume the same people. That, you know, whether you're going to, um, you know, add more automation, you're going to increase your test coverage, or you're going to do integration, you know, you're all fighting for res the same resources. So, um, so yeah, it's it is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. So look, at it. it depends on the people. Like if if it's, if you're a uh, um, if you're an F stat and you're focusing on increasing the test value, that's your that's what you that's your goal. If you're a, a front end developer, you want to run the test that the build would pass. 
So you want to get the bill with cat, it's something that's flaky, that annoys, that's the most annoying thing for them. If one test is flaky, they hate it. If you're a manual test and you have to, 99% of the tests are passing and there's one that's flaky, okay, I'll test that manually. But for developers, for front end developers and back end developers, that would, that would be a killer. Kilo for project, that means uh, for end-to-end uh, -end testing project. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let me let me um, move to this next. This is the last question we have in this section. So, what do you expect the biggest trends to be in three years? Um, so, if I go back and, and just I'll just remind you, I won't go back to that slide, but what did they say are the biggest trends impacting testing now? They said CI/CD, which doesn't even show up on this <laughs> on this list. Um, AI-assisted testing was at 46%. You can see how it's kind of rocketed up to 79%. So they, they do think that there's definitely going to be more of a shift toward AI-assisted testing. Um, continuous testing still shows up pretty high. Testing in production jumped up several spots. And one that fell down a little bit was uh, shifting left. So I just wanted to, to get your thoughts here, um, given you know, what we saw earlier in terms of the priorities uh, with CICD being at the top. And, and now not even making this list, it was below 19%, and, um, and AI-assisted testing moving up the, the priorities. Um, Federico, do, would you like to take this question? Yeah, I mean, uh, AI, I think it's everywhere. It always appears when you ask for trends, right? Nowadays, this is the, the, the common buzzword uh, around everything, and also in testing. And in some cases, you, you can get a lot of benefit for sure, but uh, what I typically say is that I don't care if it, there is uh, an AI behind this feature or not. The, the, the important thing is that uh, you are solving the problems I have or not. But uh, yeah, for sure people uh, see this as a, as a trend. I think it's, uh, it's, it's expected. <laughs> and uh, related continuous integration and continuous del delivery that you, you asked, I think it's pretty much established and maybe that's why they, they don't see it as, as a trend nowadays. I don't know what Oren thinks about that, that but uh, in our teams, I, I think this is, I, I remember some years ago when, <laughs> many years ago, when we started to use like a JIT or, or, or tools, tools like this. It's like at the beginning, you, you had to learn how to use the tools and, and, and you, you see like a, the, the, the people started to adopt, but nowadays you cannot think about uh, starting a project without a, 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 um, a repository of your source code. So the same is happening now with CICD, I think. So probably that's why it's not in, in the list anymore. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I think that's um, um, a, a good insight that, that the CICD is one of those things that is kind of, you know, they're getting, they're getting that problem solved today. Uh, most tools support that, and so now they're moving on to to what the next thing is going to be. Um, Oren, any thoughts on this question? Uh, I agree with Federico, uh, and, and the shift lab will be in the CI/CD. That that's already in the happening, and um, and and the AI. I think there's there's more. I think what they're saying here, there's going to be more adoption also. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next section, which was really about um, to see if there's any COVID-19 impacts on test and on QA and test teams. So the first question, I'm gonna skip the poll question. The first question was really uh, similar to this one, or the poll question was similar to this one, but has COVID-19 impacted your team? And about two thirds, and we did this, we did this in May and June. So, you know, we were through that initial quarantine shutdown timeframe. You know, a lot of people had already moved to remote and we, we certainly had felt the effects in a lot of our communities of, of what uh, COVID, you know, a lot of things have changed since then. You know, a lot of um, places have opened back up, you know, people have gone back into offices and stuff. But at the time we asked this question, had it impacted their team? Less than two thirds said and really said no. Um, and then we asked, how did it impact their budget? And uh, three fourths, over three fourths said that it that it caused them to decrease their budget by um, 
by some amount. Um, 43% say more than 10% had decreased their budget. Now, some people actually said it increased their budget, and I find that a little bit interesting to see, you know, does that mean that they are, are um, you know, deciding to automate more? And so they're hiring and automating more? Um, what does that mean? So I'll, I'll turn to uh, our experts here. Um, Oren, what, what do you think about, um, number one, the, uh, the results of this slide, and, and number two, more specifically, how do you think about the, the particular increases in budget? So, so the in, in, increase, first of all, there's a, I think there's a, people have two different types of budgets, which are, and they, they, somehow, they somehow separated between uh, a person and for tooling. And uh, I think that regarding uh, people, most people did, uh, most companies had suffered from COVID. Most, oh, I'm saying 99% of the, the companies suffered from, from COVID and they adjusted what they thought they need to do to make sure that they pass uh, COVID successfully. But if you, if you do, if you do save uh, money on, on, on people and don't hire the extra, uh, the, an additional developer, um, you do want to have some time, uh, want to use some more tooling. And I think that's what happens is that you, you might say, hey, I still have the goals. I still want to release. What is the best option for me? Uh, because those usually are less expensive than, than hiring someone full time. And you can see that, that they increase the budget of the tooling as opposed to um, as opposed to there might be some decrease in in uh, or or you don't hire another person but they might add more tooling to automate part, big parts of that and um, and that that's what I think is happening yeah that makes a lot of sense uh, Federico you um, you know you deal with a bunch of uh, clients and stuff how do you um, you know how, how is how have you seen COVID impacting your clients and the people that you work with yeah, it's also uh, the, the numbers. I, I don't remember exactly the numbers. I've seen a decrease. The, the, the increase, when the budget increases, it, I don't think it was related or, or impacted by the COVID directly. Um, but I think the, 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 the impact of the COVID, to, to try to see a silver lining here, it was not only related to the to the budget. Uh, the, for for me, one of the impacts also was like a, a acceleration in a cultural shift. Because uh, now nowadays now that nowadays I think there is um, more acceptance to the fact that the team can be distributed and working perfectly if they are working in, the, in their homes in different parts of the same city, or maybe in different cities, or maybe even in different countries. So at the beginning, we noticed the, the decrease in, in, in many of our customers, but nowadays I, I think we should be, the, the companies should be more open to uh, consider outsourcing their part of their team to, to other countries as, as well. So. Mm. So you think it's more also globalization? Yeah. We'll get, of course, we'll get a boost, and, and because of that, uh, if you can hire in different country, then that would, uh, you can, uh, the expenses would, would lower. Yeah, the, the important things are, you know, that you have the communication skills, the communication platforms, the tools that you learn how to use the tools that the team is uh, are, are using. And uh, of course, if you're in an agile environment, you need some time overlap uh, if you are in more or less in the same time zone. But given, given that you have this uh, in, in, in place, you can work from anywhere and it's going to be the same. Mm -hmm. I know about in San Francisco, <laughs> um, mm. rent has gone down by 30% because so many people are leaving. So they're saying, hey, why do I, everyone's working remote, and uh, I know so many people that, that left the city. Wow. Um, so I'm just going to cover these next two questions, or I'll show you the results. In other words, so how has COVID impacted your test automation initiative? 
Um, now, I don't know really, I got too much insight out of here. 45% uh, said it slowed down the initiative, 40% said it accelerated adoption of test automation, and then 15%. So it's, it's kind of um, an interesting uh, dynamic that it's slowing down on some ends, we can make some guesses about why that happened, you know, because, um, you know, it, it hurt budgets and stuff and, um, you know, accelerated adoption test automation in other places because, you know, they want to be more efficient. They want to um, come out of this, this um, you know, this time in a better place. Um, and 15% and showed no impact. If I move to the next slide, how, how has it impacted your organization and how your organization managed QA? I mean, the biggest answer here was it mostly stayed the same. So, you know, we, we are finding that, um, you know, there are some changes, as you can see, you know, QA moving to QA engineers and an agile team. Um, you know, some QA is moving toward the app de developers. So the app developers are doing more of the QA. But for the most part, you know, at least half or almost half, I should say, are, are really staying the same. So I want to move to our, our final topic here. And this is... Um, Shifting gears. So this is outside of the survey that we did, but in a way, it's it's using data that we we collected in a different way. So I'll I'll explain. So <clears throat> we we posted a blog um, on Testum, and the blog you can see the link there. It's called um, um, Puppeteer Selenium Playwright Cypress How to Choose, and it really was meant to be our evaluation of these different open source frameworks. And and we we use them. We rely on them. We um, work with those tools and our developers have, have used them in different organizations, et cetera. And, and they, they said, well, let's, let's build this blog and it'll help some of our, our customers or, or people who are interested in these different frameworks to evaluate them. And so we went through and we rated them on different categories. You can see the, the you know, how we rated them. So, um, you know, cross browser, for instance, we rated Puppeteer at a two and a player at a three and Selenium a five because they cover more browsers, Cypress a two. You know the justification for each one of these ratings is in that blog and so you can go determine whether they they make sense to you or not and then we went through and, and you can see each category multi-tab and frames authoring speed user simulation fidelity you know how well does it actually capture what your user would do um the the thing that's kind of interesting here is we have an importance category and this importance was default set to medium so number three but each person could go through as they're building out the, or as they're reading the blog and they could customize this. So they could select, you know, cross browsers, not very important to them. They could lo lower that down to a one. They could say that execution speed is really important to them and move it up to a four or five stability. They can move that to a four or five. And it kind of gave some insights as to, um, you know, what they thought priorities were. So with that said, I'm going to go to the next slide and ask our, our, two, um, our two experts here, based on over 1,400 blog visitors that actually adjusted these weightings, what do you think they rated as the top categories, the most important ones on their weightings? So, uh, Orrin, do you have any thoughts here out of this list um, what they picked as the top? So, so let, let, me, let me start with what is the five, and then let me tell you what, what I think is the the order between them. Um, authoring speed, that's of course, I think people want, they want speed on both ways. I think the authoring speed and the execution speed. Debugging, that's the most important thing. Well, I'm biased, but for me, the most important thing in the universe is, is always the way to debug something. If something doesn't work, I need to, I have to debug it. That's the most important thing for me. Um, and, uh, so those three would be um, multi-tab and frame. Of uh, my guess is that most people are not aware of those things, of those you know, limitations, like that Cypress doesn't support multiple tabs or iframes or things like that. So I'm saying with lower, even the stability and of course stability. So I would go with the authoring speed, test speed, Debugging. I don't know where people might write docs and resources instead of that, but mine would be at least debugging and and stability. Federico, what are your choices for the tops? Um, if I had to choose only one, uh, I will go with stability, and maybe after that, authoring speed uh, and cross browser. 
would be the most important in, in uh, the conversations I have had with customers. All right, so let's see what the results were. Wait, wait a second. Oh. Sean, are we guessing what, what, the, what, um, what people are choosing or what are we choosing? What we think is the best? Oh, I, I, we're, we're guessing what they, they rated as the top ones. <laughs> okay, okay. Are you changing your mind? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> All right, so stability came out top. Execution speed came out as number two. Authoring speed was number three. So you guys did mention both stability and authoring speed as two of your top. Oren, you mentioned debugging right up at the top. I think the one that kind of shows up a little higher than um, I was hearing from you two before was execution speed. Um, but the other two definitely right in the top. So uh, I think you guys have passed the test and you um, <laughs> qualified as representing the people who are actually out there. So that, that's really good. Um, some, some interesting um, multi-tab and frame, self-healing test, autom autonomous testing, you know, those things showed up down near the bottom. Um, that could be because they they don't um, they they recognize those things aren't in some of those platforms, or they just don't they don't um, know what they are, or you know, a lot of other reasons. But anyway, so I thought I thought this was an interesting data that we pulled out of our our um, our blog and people had ranked them. You know, this is all anonymous, so you know. You know, don't don't worry. We we didn't we're not taking anybody's uh, special data or anything like that. But it was just a way to kind of see what what um, people thought were were important in terms of categories of different platforms. So, um, so with, with that said, I, we reached the end of the hour and we reached the end of our questions. Is there any final thoughts that uh, you would have, Oren? Start with you. Um, I think I think we'll. What we all good we saw was the the shifting left is occurring more people want more coverage and the only way of getting more coverage would be with better more stable tests and I guess my I would say tip of the day would be uh, start having few tests connecting that to the CI stable test and instead of trying to get a thousand in. And, and not not stable again one at a time to get everyone everyone uh, would be more in favor of, of adding those automation to the CI CI CD testing. Federico, your final thoughts. Well, first of all, uh, thank you again for inviting me to to participate here, and Thanks for being thank you guys for. Uh, getting this information and, and offering to to the community because this is uh, this will allow us to make better decisions uh, when when deciding which framework uh, or which uh, even which factors we should be paying attention or which are the trends to to have this information is crucial to to make better decisions so thank you for for that effort. All right, well, well, thank you so, both of you. Um, Yes, sir. Sean, thank you so much for organizing all this. Thank you uh, for sending this out and, and, and put to everyone. Uh, just uh, uh, one more applause. Uh, thank you, Federico, of course, for for um, uh, for coming and, and uh, joining us today. Yeah, yeah sure. appreciate both your insights. It was re really helpful. So with that, I'm going to close the conference call. I will say that um, you guys can go out and check out that blog that I mentioned here. It's uh, it's 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 featured on our uh, testum.io slash blog. It's the top top blog there, and um, we'll probably put this stuff into some sort of a um, um, you know summarized form in an infographic or a blog that that'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. With that, I'm going to close the call. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.